evening or good afternoon from wherever you are. We're so privileged today to have with us the man of the R, Dr. Jamie Ledecastro, to talk about uh, neuropathic uh, intervention um, using ultrasound uh, ultrasound uh, procedures. So before we start, Dr. Jim, will you allow us to say, say a prayer first? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So, Heavenly Father, we praise you for this day. We thank you for uh, keeping us all safe uh, wherever we are. Um, please help us as we try to learn more for our patients and uh, to improve our practice uh, in this setting and in this pandemic. Bless our speaker, bless our attendees. And uh, dear Lord God, just continue to uh, give us all of this knowledge uh, so that we can glorify you through this. All these we ask in your name. Amen. Okay, so good morning, everyone. So I'm sorry that uh, I think I have a mixed up on schedule with Dr. Daniel Nishman. It could be Wednesday, though, because there were two dates given to me. It's May 16 and May 18. I might have misinterpreted the date, but... Anyway, since you are all here, I would like to share to you, well, this is my lecture that uh, I'm going to give uh, next week in the uh, Regenerative Conference in Utah, and you'll be the first audience for this, okay? So it's always an honor to be with you and to share things uh, with you, and I hope uh, this will also... Uh, change your practice, especially as we are still in the pandemic and we are still uh, struggling with all these things that's happening with us today. Okay, so the, my, my topic is about ultrasound-guided regenerative interventions in neuropathic pain. This is actually an update, so you will notice here a lot of new information that I'm going to share with you. So as usual, we'll, we'll start with this beautiful Bible text I found in Isaiah 40, 30, and 31. It says, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So what is a neuropathic pain? <clears throat> okay, according to the International Association for the Study of Pain, they defined neuropathic pain as a pain caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory system so in other words any pain that doesn't have any involvement or lesion affecting the somatosensory system is not considered a neuropathic pain in fact they were saying according to this definition uh, the latest icd-10 they're saying that uh, pain that sort of uh, simulates uh, neuropathic pain but cannot be found to have any somatosensory system or it could just affect the soft tissues that is around it are better off referred to as nociceptive pain and not neuropathic pain. So just to make a distinction between the two, so neuropathic pain, somatosensory system lesion, nociceptive pain, there is no somatosensory lesion, but the pain is actually affecting the uh, soft tissues that is around the nerves or the down those tissues that are uh, part of the somatosensory system. So the epidemiology, so there's about, uh, this is very new. So in a research done by Dr. Wang, there's about 6.9 to 10% of the population suffering from this problem. And in fact, it represents 20 to 25% of chronic, chronic pains. So if you have chronic pains, 20 to 25% of those pains can be because of the uh, neuropathic pain. And the bad news is that less than 50% of the current analgesics provide even 50% of pain relief. Can you imagine that? How frustrating it is to uh, uh, deal with these uh, problems because uh, the, the effectivity of the drugs that the uh, patient may experience, of course, is less than 50% effectivity. So there's a lot of challenges here. And of course, the cost here, $1 trillion per, per year. 
So that's the amount of money that is uh, ne needed to be able to address this problem. And of course, those affected usually are those with poorer health and ha it has a greater disability. And of course, quality of relationships and productivity is also affected. Your sleep patterns, the emotional and mental health is affected uh, as well. So there's really a lot of uh, issues that is uh, coming up with these problems. Now, this is the somatosensory system and uh, it's, uh, it's diagrammatically illustrated here. And you can see that any part of this system up to the pre-motor cortex, of course, is considered to be, a, be affected in neuropathic pain. So you can see here the ascending pathway, the, of course, the sensory portion, the uh, synapse, the peripheral nerve, and then, up, of course, up to the thal thalamic area. So any lesion affecting this part is considered to be causing neuropathic pain. So the specific neuropathic pain that we are going to talk will be focused more on the peripheral nerves. So we're not going to deal about the other parts, the brain and of course the spinal cord, but we'll, we're gonna focus more on the peripheral nerve uh, lesion. So here, the peripheral nerve together with the brachial plexus represents 95% of this, this one is in the US general population. So that's a lot of, of injuries. And 30% of those peripheral nerve injury consider their pain to be both intense and of course chronic. So as you can see here, it's chronic and it's also intense. And at the same time, 2% to 60% of post-surgical patients will usually have peripheral nerve trauma with neuroma formation. So there is, of course, a neuropathic pain in the process. So you can see here that uh, there's really a lot of challenges in this, in this problem. So this is an original picture <coughs> of uh, Ramon Kajal's uh, uh, research. This was 1991. And he pointed out here how a transitive nerve really looks like and the process by which the nerve again regenerates. So letter C, which is at the middle, is uh, the portion of the transected nerve. And of course, uh, letter B here is the transective, a transected area from proximal to distal stump. And letter A here is when it demonstrates regenerative nerve sprouts. So you can see here that those dots, the, the black part, are the process by which the nerve um, tries to connect itself back to its original uh, status. And of course, uh, you can you will notice here that it, go, it moves in different directions. But you can also see a pattern that it goes towards the center, trying to, again, uh, merge with the original uh, nerve on the distal part in order to connect it. So this is a picture of a neuroma of the nerve, whereby uh, this area is heterogeneous and, of course, bulbous. And you can see here a bizarre pattern of uh, the nerves, as you can see here, and there's, there's a lot of fluid around it. Okay, so this is actually considered to be a mass. It's like a mass at the terminal ends of the nerve that, that was injured. And it could also happen in between nerves. Uh, areas that are painful could, could actually present as... Um, uh, areas that are not necessarily severe, but can form what they sometimes refer to as inter uh, inter digital uh, neuroma, with, in which the nerves at the middle are the ones that is affected and not really necessarily the terminal portion of the nerve. And this is a picture of how a nerve would look like when there is uh, a surgical removal of that. Uh, painful neuroma that may be causing a lot of problems in our patients. So th that's uh, really the picture of that. Now, this is a cross-section comparing ultrasound and histology about what happened with the nerves. So as you can see here, uh, for, for instance, in this case here, you can still see some honeycomb pattern of the nerves. In other words, this part seems to be still intact. 
although there are fluids that's that's already present. But here you can see a bizarre heterogeneous pattern that you don't cannot anymore distinguish a nerve from other tissues. And then this one is the uh, the one that is uh, at the terminal part. So as you can see here, this is the cut ends. And actually, if you will notice, the, the swelling is right here at letter B. So if this is your histological findings, this is also your ultrasound findings. It's very interesting that they compare it. And this is a, a, a research done by Dr. Burke in 2017. Now, in any neuropathic pain, there are always biomarkers. And interestingly, these biomarkers are very important uh, information that we can use, especially uh, when we are dealing with uh, neuropathic pain. And note here that when there is a nerve injury, it usually releases pro-inflammatory cytokines. And these pro-inflammatory cytokines exist in not only in the nerves, but also in the joint. So for instance, you have a joint pain, you have uh, osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. Inflammatory cytokines are always present. So whether we're dealing with nerves or joints or tissues or tendons or muscles, for as long as there is inflammation right there, pro-inflammatory cytokines are present. And we are familiar with this because in this pandemic, we are always thinking about cytokine storm. And this is exactly the ingredient of a cytokine storm. We have interleukin-1 beta, TNF-alpha, interleukin-6. So these are, in a cytokine storm, for example, th this comes in more volume and <clears throat> really affecting the lung in the process. But interestingly, in this case, it is also present in the nerve, in the nerve injury. So, and this is coming from an activated microglia and astrocytes. So if you will notice, the microglia are glial cells or supporting cells coming from the central nervous system. And so how come this is the source of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, it only shows to us that there is a coordination between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, or what is sometimes called the central sensitization and peripheral sensitization. Within 24 hours, microglia is present. And this is the one that they are saying to be the source or the, the one that induces the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And eventually after that, after 24 hours, of course, there's another cell, astrocytes, which persist up to 12 weeks. And these are the ones that actually gives you all this pain sensation that you feel. In fact, they're saying that microglia and astrocytes are released at the same time, only that the microglia is only available within 24 hours and astrocytes persist up to 12 weeks. And note that glial cells form 70% of our central nervous system cells. So very interesting. So you can see in this, in this diagrammatic uh, um, picture, how all these kind of cells are moving towards the peripheral nerve injury. Now, this is another challenging picture of how microglia under normal conditions is actually working. So I, I would say the microglia under normal circumstances are agent to prune nerves, especially those that are ne not needed anymore in order to promote neuronal survival. In other words, this kind of cleanses the area. As, so as you can see here, the microglia will release some of the good factors here that is responsible for regenerating tissues that are uh, dead already. And at the same time, it removes the cells that are not needed in the process. So same here, it, 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 it participates in trying to prune those uh, areas that are not needed to promote neuronal survival. So very interesting. Now here, we also mentioned about two cells. Number one is M1 and the other one is M2. Now what's the difference? Now the M1 is the one that's actually causing a lot of pain. So there are two macrophages, M1, they are the ones that causes the pain because it has a role in Wallerian degeneration and at the same time release of pre-inflammatory cytokines. So remember the previous slide, we have microglia and here we have M1 causing hyperalgesia. In contrast to that, we have M2, which is the one that inhibits pain sens sensitization. So M1, M2, both are macrophage. The only difference is they have a different work. One, uh, induces or enhances pain sensation. 
the other one inhibits pain sensation. Now, as we go through the process of uh, other treatments, then we will know what are the uh, role of MSCs. Now, another thing is here in the terminal neurons, uh, aside from the microglia, the M1, it also induces T cells to be present. So the T cells here goes to the terminal neuron, goes to the dorsal root ganglion, in fact, goes to the dorsal horn. I suspect the T cells early on are the ones that are uh, acting as messengers to go to those different areas to tell to tell every, uh, every part of the CNS that there is, is an inflammation of the peripheral nerve. So it's like a messenger and it releases and then activates what we call the NMDA receptor, NMDA, which is the one that uh, uh, actually activates all the processes of the synapse in order to enhance the pain sensation much more. So you can just imagine all these processes are happening very quickly and the result is that your patient is suffering from pain. And you can see here that the astrocytes, the microglia, all of these are coming into play in order to make this really a more challenging pain sensation for your patients. Now, at the same time, when the T cells reaches the dorsal horn, it activates another important uh, uh, protein kinase. We call it the mitogen associated protein kinase, MAPK, P38. And this MAPK also sends signals to the brain, sends signals to the spinal cord. And this is the reason why uh, it doesn't only register as pain in the peripheral, but sometimes even uh, the way we react to a pain sensation is also affected <coughs> because of the <coughs> MAPK release. So, very interesting how all of these are coordinated to affect both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Now here at the dorsal root ganglion, we're saying it's uh, sent by your T, T cells, but when, when there is uh, already the pro-inflammatory cytokines in the form of TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, beta, interleukin-6, it also stimulates the ion channels. And you know exactly that ion channels would include trip, trip family or, or uh, uh, nub family, which are actually uh, subserved by the sodium channel. And this one are the one that enhances more. In fact, what they're saying is that when there is an injury over the skin, just at the surface, it right away activate these ion channels. And interestingly, ion channels also send signals to the dorsal root ganglion, okay? Let me just go back to this one. Sorry for that. Okay. And then it releases all the substances that is important also in the process of the formation of neuropathic pain. Now, right here, you will notice that the trip family, okay, which we are mentioning is, of course, initiated by uh, the release of TNF-1 beta, but at the same time, when trip family is innervated, uh, is uh, uh, stimulated, it also uh, sends signals to the dorsal horn to release substance P and CGRP. And you know that these are the ones that's causing pain. The substance P right here and CGRP. So trip B1, substance P, CGRP, and then, of course, there's a TNF alpha right there. Of course, it also influences the release of calcium. So all of these processes are so uh, synchronized that the release will happen not only at the peripheral, but also at the central. Now, the trip B1 of the trips, I should say, there are only two trips that are uh, activated, or I would say, uh, that really actively participated in, in neuropathic. And this is your trip V1. Trip V1 is enhanced by TNF alpha, while NAB 1.8 is enhanced by interleukin 1 beta. And where, once these two things are available, these two events are enhanced further by the P38 and APK in the dorsal root ganglion of the mitogen associated protein kinase. So uh, as you can see here, 
from the beginning we have we have first the my the microglia and then we have the t cells and then we have the m1 these are all the bad guys that causes the uh the neuropathic pain and then from here it will also enhance the trip v1 and trip v1 will enhance uh the release of substance p and cgrp which is even enhancing the pain sensation and not one 0.8 will enhance interleukin 1 beta. And further disturbance are enhanced by P38 and APK in the dorsal ventilation. So very exciting process of pain. But of the TRIPS, only TRIP V1 and TRIP A1 will show hyper, reduced pain hypersensitivity when blocked pharmacologically. In other words, those other TRIPS cannot be influenced by any pharmacology at present, of course, that is as far as we know. And those of you who are doing uh, prolotherapy, neural prolotherapy using your, your uh, cells, of course, use D5 water, and this is the one that blocks trip V1, you know that. And there's a series of treatment, of course, it doesn't respond right away, but th there's a series of, re of, re of reaction here. Now, how do we diagnose the neuropathic pain? Now, at present, it becomes very difficult. In fact, it, it is non-specific and can overlap with certain disease conditions, like the one mentioned here, neuralgia, painful diabetic neuropathy, central post-pain syndrome. And as I mentioned earlier, we have to distinguish between neuropathic pain and non-neuropathic pain. CRPS1, which we used to say to be part of neuropathic pain, is really not a neuropathic pain. It is a nociceptive pain because CRPS yes, doesn't have any pathology that involves the nerves. So because of that, we better classify that under nociceptive, but not neuropathic. Okay, now this is the challenge. The challenge is from the onset of pain to the diagnosis will take a year. So you should not be surprised if patients come to you after so many months already, because on the average, there's about 23 months or a year where the patient is diagnosed. And the bad part is that we try to treat them here and it takes another year to refer it to a pain center. So how many years now are, is the patient suffering? Two years. So this is a very recent publication, 2021, and it all only shows to us our helplessness in trying to solve this problem because of the, 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 the time it, it takes for this pain to be resolved or to be addressed. Okay, now, how do we grade neuropathic pain? So we say possible neuropathic pain when there is a history of relevant neurological lesion or disease. So we, we have an impression that maybe this is a neuropathic pain based on the history and the pain distribution much as that of our suspect. We suspect this is the problem. So it kind of, of matches that. So we say it's possible neuropathic pain. But it's also probable neuropathic pain if there is a sensory symptoms and signs that matches the neuroatomically plausible distribution on clinical examination. So we say it's probable. And then we do tests. There are tests that can confirm whether our impression is correct or not based on the symptoms of the patient. And so we can do CT scan, MRI, ultrasound, EMG, and all other tests that, that uh, we thought can possibly point to the cause of the pain. Now, so these are the tests. So we, you can choose any of these tests. So you can have CT, skin biopsy, evoke potentials, microneurography. There's a lot of tests here but we will focus more on the MSK ultrasound. So here, you are all familiar with this. Uh, this is the long axis and short axis of a normal nerve. So we have here the nerve. Of course, it is a tram track pattern and the short axis is a honeycomb pattern. And uh, obviously uh, we can distinguish it from tendons, which is usually echogenic. And it usually, uh, when we apply uh, toggling, then the appearance of the nerve remains, but the tendon kind of moved from anisotropy, uh, hypoecogenicity to ecogenic pattern. So 
that's how to distinguish it from tendons. And then of course, uh, uh, we are familiar with this, the ultrasound change is an abnormal peripheral nerve. Initially, the, the earliest findings is just a decreased echogenicity of the connective tissue layers of the nerve trunk. So we can see the nerve to be really, really small and there is, the echogenicity is hardly uh, uh, seen here. And then of course, uh, it becomes proximally swollen, uh, hypoechoic uh, hypo swelling of the, of the proximal nerves. And then when we apply pressure on the nerve that is involved, there is a tenderness on sonopal patient. And then there are abnormal flow signals by power Doppler. Uh, you can also check the power Doppler and you can see how, how bad is it. And then of course, the distal innervated muscles innervated by the peripheral nerve showed abnormal hyperechogenicity with associated muscle atrophy. So it's not only the nerve, but the muscles are on the nerve that is present. Now, this is a, a neuropractic finding in ultrasound of a peripheral nerve. So as you can see here, there's not, the swelling is actually diffuse. Okay, sorry for that. The, 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 the swelling is the same from end to end. You, cannot, you can hardly tell whether there's really diffusion or, or hypochoic swelling there. But if you take a look at the absolute value of the nerve in cross-section, then you can see that this is really abnormal. The cross-sectional area is 0 0.15. This is actually a major nerve. So you can tell that from this absolute value, this is really uh, an abnormal nerve. And in this case, this is a neuropractic nerve. In axonet mesis, uh, there is a diffuse swelling with loss of fascicular pattern. So you can see here notching right here. There's, this is where the impingement happens. And if you look at the pattern of the fascicles, you can hardly tell which from one fascicle to the other. So it kind of merges and the distinctive uh, layers are already gone. You, you cannot anymore distinguish. And of course, you, there's a fluid found around the nerve that can tell you that there is really a problem in the nerve. And of course, nerve meses where there is actually a total transection of the nerve, the, the, the end, ends of the nerve are gone. What you can see is just the covering the perineurium area, and we characterize it as an empty bed appearance of the nerve. Now, if you're doing EMG, that could really help a lot. In fact, if you combine EMG and ultrasound, your sensitivity increased from 78 to 98 percent, and at the same time, it, it can localize the lesions that could not be identified by EMG. So, very helpful uh, supplements for your uh, diagnostic uh, ability and sensitivity and your confidence of course will increase as you as you diagnose uh, uses these diagnostic modalities to be able to find the nerve problems and here you can see here that uh, the emg is also one test that you can use to monitor the regenerative process when you are already injecting your patient so very helpful uh, as a means of really finding out how how you go about monitoring your patients suffering from neuropathic pain. So how do we approach the nerve? So we have to identify the epineurium. This is a highly specialized layer of squamous cells with tight junctions and collagen fibers. And as you can see here, this is the difference between the nerve and the tendon. And of course, this is the layer of the epineurium. So you have to inject just right here. So this is the histological uh, differences uh, between your perineurium and your epineurium. So just for our uh, knowledge of how we distinguish one from the other. So how do we approach it? So let's say we're injecting a nerve root at the cervical area. So this is really how to do it. And uh, this procedure is described so many times in different papers. And what it does is it simply separates the nerve from the surrounding fascia or the outer nerve layer believed to be considered entrapped. So the injection must always be done at the perineural level. Now, I am just surprised with this study because we thought the hydrodissection was done very recently, but look at this. It, as early as 1922, they were already doing a perineural injection. So we're, we're not really the first, but we just maybe uh, repeat it right now. And there's a lot of uh, 
hype as to how we should be doing this and that is why it, it, it's becoming more popular but but in the past it's be, it's being done 1922 and of course uh, the, the treat nerve improvements can be treated using different solutions you can use prp dextrose saline and of course uh, h2m if you want so there's a lot of other uh, solutions that you can choose from now uh, this is an ultrasound guided uh, uh, nerve intervention of the media nerve. So uh, you can hydrodissect the area in order to separate the nerve from the surrounding tissues and see how things are going with all these procedures and how it could benefit your patient. So what are the regenerative interventions for neuropathic pain? Now I've shown this picture earlier but this was a paper that was released May 3, 2021. This is very recent. And the title of the paper is Stem Cell Therapy for Modulating Neuroinflammation in Neuropathic Pain. So they were using different solutions. In this case, they were using a lot of uh, the synchymal stem cells coming from your bone marrow, your fat, and then of course your um, umbilical cord. So here, if you remember, we have two macrophages. We have the M1, which is the one responsible for enhancing pain. And we have the M2, which is the one that inhibits pain. And when MACs are injected, it will release different growth factors. And of course, it also influences the mRNA. And of course, we have other growth factors that are released, like your transforming growth factor beta-1. And all of these are responsible for actually regenerating the nerve that is injured due to the peripheral nerve injury. So you can see here that it attacks all uh, areas, attacking the M1, attacking the areas that have been destroyed, and at the same time, releasing growth factors that are believed to help in the regeneration process. And, that, and here you can also say, uh, see that uh, it doesn't only work at the level of your peripheral nerve per se, but it also goes to your dorsal horn at the dorsal root ganglion where the MAPK is, is, is found. Remember the P38, mitogen associated protein kinase, they have different uh, MAPKs in the dorsal horn and it also is influenced by the injections that we do with the mesenchymal cells because of its ability to go to areas that are painful beyond where you have actually injected them. So it's neuroprotective in nerve injury as shown in some studies. And of course, it is immunomodulatory and it upregulates T-cells. So in the process, it alleviates mechanical allodynia and of course, thermal hyperalgesia. So this is a research done by Joshi and his colleagues. And of course, the adipose human stem cells can also mitigate thermal hyperalgesia, upregulate interleukin 10. These are the good cytokines. Downregulate interleukin 1 beta. These are the bad cytokines and interleukin 6. And it has an anti inflammatory effect through its role in MAPK. So, very interesting for adipose human stem cells. And then, of course, uh, the GDNF, CGF, and VGF are important regulators of nerve regeneration. When you inject this, this part, it will help in the regeneration of the nerve that is affected. It doesn't happen overnight. There's always a process involved. So sometimes the patients expect you that you inject it this week and next week they're okay. It doesn't happen that way. Usually it takes two to three months for all these things to really take place. Now, how about uh, for uh, using uh, PRP for neuropathic pain? So this is a research done uh, also very recently, April 1, 2020, where 60 adults with type 2 diabetes mellitus were treated for six months and assess at different intervals, one month, three months, and six months. And they were divided into two groups. One group was treated with a perineural injection with PRP. And of course, the second group was just treated medically. So what's the result? The result shows that PRP is an effective treatment for diabetic neuropathic pain and has shown significant alleviate, uh, significantly to alleviate neuropathic pain and numbness symptoms. So very interesting that if we do the right uh, mixture of PRP because as you can see uh, there's a lot of people doing PRP which is not really PRP 
it has to be a platelet rich PRP. In other words, the, the number of platelets should be four to five times the normal. Otherwise, it will just be considered a platelet poor plasma or PPP. So when we talk about this, it has to be emphasized that it is really a PRP so that it will make a difference in your patient when you inject them and you have to inject them on the right spot. So nerve conduction studies show there's a significant improvement after injection. So you can, you can uh, document it because the study shows it is much, much better. Now, how about alpha-2 macroglobulin for peripheral nerve lesions? Now, this is a study also very recently, 2020, where they inject the thoracic outlet syndrome and uh, in a cervical brachial syndrome using alpha-2 macroglobulin. So this is a retrospective study, and they are doing it for the thoracic outlet syndrome. 62 patients were enrolled with 46 uh, females and 60 males, aged 23 to 77 years old. And these are the patients. 23 has CRPS1, 18 has thoracic outlet syndrome, and 21 with MTP pain, so the thoracophalangeal joint pain. And they were also evaluated one, three, and six months using brief inventory, brief pain inventory uh, um, measures. Now, uh, the results showed that 61% of thoracic outlet syndrome achieved clinical endpoints at three months. So you can see that the period it takes is not very quick. In this case, three months and only 35% with CRPS improvement. So CRPS is not a neuropathic pain as we say, it's just a nociceptive pain. So not much recovery, but for thoracic outlet syndrome where nerves are involved, the, the results are 61%. And 24% of, of course, for MTP pain. So those pain that involves the joints, not much as well. And at six months, an additional 30% of TOS group achieved further pain improvements, 13% for CRPS group and 18% of the MTP group. So the process takes a while. If you, if you look at the study, it requires about three to six months for the, the A2M injections to kick in and really influence the results of the patient. This is good enough as we have seen initially in the lecture that less than 50% of the patients are relieved by the available drugs in the form of gabapentin, Lyrica, and whatever you're doing using for treatment. Uh, so sometimes it's very frustrating. So the conclusion is A2M is more effective for TUS than in CRPS. Now, another recent study, this is also published 2020, for chronic pelvic pain. And so when we deal with patients with chronic pelvic pain, we always think about uh, the perineal nerve and of course the pudendal nerve. And here in this case, the injected alcox canal where the pudendal nerve is and the hydrodisagnate part. And it gives a very good result for those patients suffering from chronic pelvic pain syndrome. This is a very difficult, uh, areas to inject. I've encountered two patients with this problem and I could hardly make them any better. Of course, uh, the other one, I did only uh, dextrous water, no relief at all. The other one was given uh, medication, no relief. And A2M at the time was not yet available, so we cannot try this uh, treatment. And then, of course, uh, the interesting thing about this is that the A2M as I've said initially, is targeting the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are available both in the joints and in the nerves. But since we're talking about neuropathic nerves, these pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are present in the nerves, are the ones which the A2M are targeting. So they form actually um, a complex. When they react to it, they form a complex. And, and since the A2M is considered to be a cytokine carrier, they kind of remove it. And A2M also is a broad spectrum proteinase inhibitor, which is involving the ADAMS and the MMPs or matrix metalloproteases. These are the ones being targeted in the process of treatment. And you can see here how the A2M works in the joints as well. So uh, affecting the pro-inflammatory cytokines in the joints, and of course the ADAMS and the MMPs, and also influences the articular cartilage regeneration. So in fact, 
the initial study of A2M is not really directed on nerves. It is directed on the joints because it has a very good effect on the articular cartilage. But only recently have we also noticed the A2M working on nerves, especially on neuropathic pain. So what is A2M? So there are two publications. Uh, this one wrote, written in, uh, in San Diego, California. And the other one, I, I wrote it two, two years ago in two, 2019, yes. So what is A2M? This is a plasma protease inhibitor. It's a cytokine carrier. It's a ligand for cell signaling receptors. It binds TNF-alpha, interleukin-1 beta, inhibits endotoxin to toxicity. It inhibits interleukin-6 and interleukin-18. It alleviates neuropathic pain and reduces cartilage loss by slowing cartilage regeneration. So that was what we say that to be the initial effect of, of, uh, of, of A2M uh, uh, before the, that was used for nerves. And of course, it is an endogenous inhibitor of ADAM7, ADAM12, and MMPs, okay? So I just would like to present a case. Uh, Pash knows this very well. It's 35-year-old female, transtibial amputee of seven years duration, been using baloney prosthesis for seven years, developed stump pain of three months duration, treated with pain medications with temporary relief. And I also did PRP for three sessions with temporary relief. And so we say we would try to do an A2M injection. And this is the image that we saw. There's a neuroma formation right at the sciatic nerve, okay? When we do the power doppler, you can see a lot of inflammatory process going on. And then we go right away to injecting 2D because that was what she requested that we do for this patient. And then after giving two sessions of A2M, two weeks apart, here is the result. He was actively engaged in different sports activity. In fact, up to uh, after two years from the last treatment, there were no recurrence of pain. And uh, I'm so happy with this patient because he's so active in so many things and he has improved a lot after having so much frustrations with the initial treatment. So in summary, it is important to make a distinction between a nociceptive versus neuropathic pain. So non-neural is nociceptive, neural is neuropathic. And basic knowledge about the dynamics of the pathophysiology of neuropathic pain is important to understand the appropriate intervention that needs to be done. So if it's a neuropathic pain, as you suspect it is, then do what is necessary for the patient. And present medical intervention can only provide less than 50% pain relief. That is what we found out in recent years. And of course, neuropathic pain can exist in 20 to 25% of chronic pain. So that's a very important information for us. If you are dealing with chronic pains, maybe 20 to 25% of those patients may have neuropathic. So it's time to really uh, check and find out if they have. Then of course, the diagnosis of neuropathic pain takes an average of one year, while an additional one year is needed for pain center referral. So maybe you've seen patients more than a year, one year. So it's just the, it's just the, the usual thing that, that could happen to your patient. And of course, pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines exist in both degenerative joint disease and peripheral nerve injuries and are more often similar. So regenerative therapy provides a potential for treatment in patients with neuropathic pains, although there are still positive of studies at present. So thank you very much and welcome to the Philippines. This is uh, my lecture for today and thank you for your time. Any questions? Yay, thank you very much, Dr. Jim. This was really a very good lecture and we're so honored that we saw it, uh, you know, prior to your actual lecture to be given uh, abroad again. So uh, are there, or while we're waiting for any questions, I have a question, Dr. Jim. Would, yes. uh, would glucocyte-rich or glucocyte-poor PRP, um, you know, affect uh, the case if you were to treat something with diabetic neuropathy? Will it matter, Dr. Jim, for treating them? Very good question, Pash. You know the answer, Pash. Why are you asking me that question? <laughs> Okay, okay, leukocyte rich is, is better off with tendons, okay? But for nerves, you can just use the leukocyte poor or in fact, in some cases, in the A2M, we're actually using the platelet poor, 
but the only the only other uh, step that we have to do is we have to filter it if you're using acetonics you have to spin it more in order to get that a to m substance so i would say uh, leukocyte poor is better off with nerves again the other reason is because of the presence of ngf the nerve growth factor is very painful and in fact it is considered to be part of the inflammatory neurotransmitters together with nitric oxide yeah okay so thank you dr jim dr